few weeks back, probably three weeks back, I know I did say that we'll be starting on a series on the factors that keep us away from kingdom principles. And we read a passage and we was moving towards that, but uh, this a couple of days ago, and Friday actually, as I was meditating on God's word, uh, this passage that we'll be sharing this morning came to my attention for very few minutes before we go into a time of altar call this morning. The, the message I want to title this morning is called Revived to Rebuild. Revived to Rebuild. We all pray for revival. We all like revival. We all urge to see a revival. We use that phrase quite often in our prayers. In fact, this week is fasting prayer. And there's some notion in somebody else's mind that apparently the end of such fasting prayers, there's a revival breaking out. This Quite often in the Christendom or in churches, a preconceived notion of what revival is all about. But what happens after revival? Why do you want to get revived? What is the purpose of getting revived? Give us a revival. Revive us, Lord. Revive the church. Revive my home. I want to focus from what Prophet Haggai spoke in his message to the people of Judah. Of what really reviving it is as far as rebuilding is concerned. I know we usually pronounce his name as Haggai, but it's really Haggai. Uh, uh, and his name really means celebration in a festive manner. This man was a very profound voice to the people of that land at that time. Him along with Zechariah. Whenever you study the book of Haggai... Haggai comes along with the timeline when you read the books of Nehemiah and Ezra, the rebuilding of the temple. This morning, the passage I want to learn, and that's why I felt so connected with the Spirit. The worship team did not know what I was going to speak this morning when they sang about stirring up. And I want to read this phrase and move on to the meditation this morning. Haggai chapter 1, uh, verse 14. Haggai chapter 1, verse 14. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Yehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of one man that was the ruler, of another that was the priest, and to the rest that there were remnant that was waiting for a change. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of one that was longing to see a change. One that was appointed to see that transformation happening. And the rest a group of people that yearned and waited and did not lose their hope. A remnant. A remnant that is waiting to see a revival but called revived to rebuild. Why was there a lack, a sludge, a laziness, an ideal atmosphere here? Quite often we speak about people being lethargic and given up and don't want to do things. They just lost hope. But this community is slightly different from that. I want you to listen carefully. They were doing certain things, but not completely what they were supposed to do as God has asked them. They hadn't given, hope on God, given up a hope on God. They were still worshiping God, but from a different, slightly miscalculated perspective than what they were supposed to. In verse 2, the premise of how this prophet starts talking this message, he responds to a voice from God. Verse 2 says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, This people says, So God is saying to prophet Haggai, this people says, the time has not come. Even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. In other words, imagine I'm God. I'm telling the prophet Haggai, this people is saying that it is not time yet to build my house. I'll bring that even better perspective. It's about my house being built by my people. 
But let me tell you, Prophet Haggai, this, my people, are saying that it is not time yet to build my house. Somewhere, the aspect of control and expectation has switched to a mode of take it for granted because we know this is how God works. It's not that we don't want to build a temple. In fact, we have already laid the groundwork. But then after that, Persians and other countries and empires attacked us, destroyed us. And in fact, the Persian governor also put a legal stay, a court order, you cannot build this church. And so we stopped building the church. But the truth is, the Persian Empire have all left. They have all left the land. Now you have all the freedom you need to build this church, build this temple. But now what has happened? In the course of time, because you stopped that whole project, you focused in building yourself, your homes, your livelihood. And now when situations have come favorable to you, you have become so used to the lifestyle you have slowly built. I hope you're with me this morning. And now, therefore, you're saying, it is not time yet. Why? Because I'm so focused in the house that I live right now. I'm so focused in trying to get our country and city and our land and our business and our agriculture together because we have been tortured and destroyed and attacked by so many other empires. Finally, we get to breathe. Finally, we get to relax. Can we just focus on ourselves some me time, please? That is why we are saying, God, we don't think it's time yet to build your house. Again, I said, not strictly a spirit of laziness or idleness, but somewhere the focus and priority has changed. And then God reminds them, let me tell you, people, Explain to me this factor, that you're saying that it is not time yet. It is time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses while this house lies desolate. You still feel that it is time to focus on your future, your needs, your plans, your dreams in the expense of my dwelling place. You still feel that it is perfectly all right to focus on all the agenda that surrounds my house, but nothing too much to build in my house. I believe this people were silent just as you were. Not knowing, so what do we do next? And it gets even much more stronger. You, considering your ways, go up to the mountains, bring wood and rebuild the temple, that I may be pleased with it and be glorified. In other words, all that you have been doing so far in restructuring and rebuilding yourselves is not fully glorifying me. If you feel that a revolution is happening, finally deliverance has come, the enemies have gone away, finally I see some light in the end of the tunnel, you feel that's where you're going, let me tell you people, you need to focus yourself in not just the light you see, but the promise and purpose that I have for you. And therefore, go to the mountains. It's not over yet. Get back and rebuild a place for me because I still don't have a place to dwell among you. Church, it's, 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 it's an utter failure for the lack of another word. If all that we build around us is something about us in the disguise of God, but really not a dwelling place for the Most High to dwell in. I'm not talking about a house. I'm not talking about this beautiful structure that the Lord has blessed us as a church. You and I know about what 1 Corinthians 3.16 and way other places where Paul says that this, the temple of God. I can do all this to look good, to say that this temple looks beautiful. I can clean up, prep up, be all GQ as you and I want. But if JC, if Christ is not deep in me, 
if I have not prepared myself as a dwelling place for the Most High to dwell in. But what has happened? Nobody's interested. Nobody's interested. That's what happened in this path. They all worship. They all have a small place to worship for God. But nobody really is interested to really go back like Solomon did and build a temple and work hard again. There's no people. Let's just do church this way. What if tomorrow another attack comes? Are we going to waste all this money we're going to put? Why go back and build another, go, go back and get wood and get all this resource again? It might be another country. The voice of negativity. Oh, come on. Let, 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 let's, not, let, let's be wise. Let's be smart in how we use our resources. We don't need to do a whole fledged. God knows our heart. You know how he spoke to Samuel? I see the inside of you, not the outside. That's the same God way we serve. Come on, Zerubbabel. Sim it down. Joshua, just do the job of your pastor, please. Just be the priest. Let's not make a huge project right now. If we are not fulfilling the purpose that he has called, it is in vain. Somewhere we have been distracted and lost focus. Where does it all start? Let me move forward. In verse 12, then, after listening to all this, they could have just walked away and said, Haggai, you're crazy. Instead of that, this is where revival really begins. Then Zerubbabel and Joshua and the remnant obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God sent him. And the people showed reverence for the Lord. They decided without really pushing away and neglecting these voice that this man, Haggai, is saying, we need to believe and understand that this is the voice of God. Myself or Pastor Sabu or the previous pastors don't take it for granted, this office that we carry. It is something that the Lord has placed in us and over us. But as responsible as we are to this duty, I pray the church together as one body respond to the word that is being heard from this pulpit. Not to say that I am God or any pastor is God, but this word is God. And if you don't respond and obey to this voice, revival will never happen. You can build all you want. I can restructure all I want. But until and unless I respond to the word and obey and say, God, you are speaking to me, I am willing to rever and fear and stand behind what you speak, that is when the Spirit stirs up. Because that is when God said, I am with you. Oh yeah, He's always with us. The keeper of Israel slumbers not sleep. We serve a God who's always with us. He knows our hearts. But I'm talking about rebuilding. I'm talking about reviving. Not the same old mundane routine style of life. Over real quick. In chapter 2, the building starts. This is the craziest thing. For months and years, they didn't want to respond. But on the first day of the sixth month is when prophets spoke to them. They responded, they obeyed. On the 24th day, they started building. 23 days, I don't know what they did. 23 days, I have no idea what they did. But one thing I know, they were ready to build on the 24th day. The Spirit stirred up on day one. They heard the voice of God on day one. They responded, obeyed on day one. And they had the assurance that God is with them on day one. And the remnant and the people came together and decided that we will start the work on day one. But then it's very clear. They came and worked on the house of the Lord on the 24th day of the sixth month. There's sometimes a process of preparation after you obey. Even after the stirring up and revival happens, there's a process of prepping and responding to the revival. It is not just a one day, it's not just a last Sunday to see. 
Because quite often we expect that it is not time yet for you to work, God. You and I witnessed what happened last Sunday. For 30-some men and women to step down in an altar here to give their decision to serve God full-time at some point in their life. That's God. That's not a work of any pastor or speaker or agenda here. When minds are ready to obey God's voice, the Spirit stirs in your heart. You don't have to wait for somebody else to come and touch your head. You obey God's word, the Spirit will stir you up. We can sing the song, stir up in our hearts, God, a passion for you, consuming fire. It is responding to that word and start the work that he wants to do. What temple? You as yourself. Parents, the temple of the home that you are in. Be the priest. I've shared this even before. The community, the ministry, the departments that you are serving with a passion. Serve. This church that God has placed as a community. Serve. Rebuild. And hence, pray for revival. Not revival, Lord, change my children, change my home, give me a job, give me this. It is not about what you want to do in your material life. It is finding a dwelling place with God. Revive me so I can have a better close relationship with you. Revive me so you prepare me to rebuild myself so that you be a dwelling place. Because when that happens is when everything else changes. It is when you and I prepare that place for God, it is God who changes all things. That is what revival should do. And when they started building, they slowly started getting distracted again. And this is what God reminded it. People, don't forget the promise I gave you back in Egypt. Chapter 2, verse 5. The promise I gave back in Egypt, I still do remember. Because my spirit abides with you. There are moments, there are things that you have heard, you have let go. You have become like this people. That let's just build our homes, let's just work. It's never going to happen. Those promises, never going to happen. But God wants to tell us something very clear, and very strong. The promise that I have given you months back, years back, I know it for sure. You obey my voice and start rebuilding yourself. I know how to work it. Why? It is not because of Zerubbabel. It is not because of Joshua. It is not because of a remnant of people that obey my voice. It is because my spirit dwells among you. That should be the desire for us as a church. That no matter what the plan or blueprint or what the decision of the church or what our future dreams might be, our focus should be so that the Spirit of God is with us. Why build? Why be revived to rebuild? The final verse, not in chapter 2, but in this passage of this part, as Haggai encourages the people, is the glory of the latter house is greater than the former. If you have that verse, put that up on the screen. I think it's verse 9, yeah, the verse 9 of chapter 2. The latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. And in this place, I will give peace. It is not about the structure that they're talking about in this verse. Because if it was structure, the temple that Solomon built was way more better than what was going to be built right now. It had some elements and components that I don't want to mention right now that this new temple did not have. It is not about a material outward structure or expression that is talking about, but it says the latter glory of this house will be greater than the former. It's a more eschatological, Christological approach that this verse is really talking about. Why? It says after that, and in this place, I will give peace. Because you are scared that you work so hard to rebuild again, to refocus again, to rebuild your dream again, and do it all over again, and here comes another attack. Here comes another voice to destroy you. Here comes another plan to bring everything down. And you're like, I knew it, I didn't want to start it all over again. I don't want to go back to the promise again. I'm done with this. But you finally revive yourself to rebuild. 
You finally gain some hope to move forward. And then you're scared it's going to happen again. But it's not about the structure you're trying to focus. It's not just this what you're rebuilding. Because the more and more you focus towards Christ, it's the one that is prepared for us. And that is what gives us peace, church. The latter house that is being built for us, as you prepare yourself, mold yourself, fine-tune yourself for the greater eternal purpose, that is what moves you towards that eternal peace, the Prince of Peace that dwells in our heart. It is not about how good I know to worship God. It is not about how good I know to preach. It is not about how good I know to lead or do my talents or skills on some kind of a platform that we have. It is how we live our day-to-day -day life, transforming ourselves, preparing ourselves for that eternal purpose that He has prepared for us to reach us for that final day, the day of the Lord. That is where the real peace is all about. Because if that was not the case, there's a couple in the medical center right now that has lost his whole stomach but still holds that peace that God is in control. Because it's not the glory of this house, but it's the gladder glory that is prepared for him. A wife that is willing to understand that, God, you are still in control. Even when my husband, who has given his whole life, coming from a different faith, I'm talking about Dr. Koresh. That she's willing to say, God, you give me the wisdom to prepare for what you have. None of us are going through anything like that to close. But the latter glory that is prepared. Can we ask for a revival to rebuild? The things that have fallen. The structures that we have built up that we call as church. The idols that I have created in myself. Band, you can come forward. Can we stand up this morning? We all want to see a miracle. This past week, I was listening to Priscilla Shire as she was speaking at the Assemblies of God General Council. This is what she said, and I loved it. We all want to see the Red Sea split, but none of us are patient enough to stand before the roaring, waving Red Sea. We all want to see the walls of Jericho fall down, but none of us are ready to be patient to walk around that wall for six days or seven days, seven times. We all want to see Goliaths fall down, but none of us want to be bold enough to stand before the challenge and say, today my God will bring you down before me. We are all willing to say that he is able enough to pull us out from a lion's den, but we are not willing to step into a lion's den in our lives. We want a miracle. We want to see him do it again, right church? But what he wants us to do again is to rebuild ourselves, to revive ourselves, to commit our heart again to God. I don't want to say the mundane story that 1987, I gave my heart to Christ and therefore I'm a Christian. Revive yourself today again. I don't want to hear the story that I've been a Christian for these many years, so therefore I have my Christ as my buddy with me. Oh yes, he's your friend, he's your companion, he's your refuge, he's your strength, a very present help in trouble. There's nothing changed to who God is, but what has changed is how I have responded to God. Can we be revived to rebuild ourselves? When we pray, Lord, wake in me, God. When we pray, Lord, Lord, stir up in me. When we pray, Lord, have your way. Understand that when you come in your way in him, he's asking that, can you prepare yourself to rebuild yourself? You're going back to school. You're going back to college. You're like, here starts a new season. Here starts a new year. I tell you, here starts a new mission for you to start. Revive me that I can be a vessel. In my senior year, in my freshman year, in my college year, in the places where you place me. I don't know where to go. It's away from my family. It's away from all my comfort zone. But it's never away from God. It is only away from God. Run away. You're only away from God when I flee from God. Because He's never away from me. Revive me, God. To rebuild a place where I never run away from you. That your presence never flees from me. As David cried, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, O God. And
please, please take not your Holy Spirit over me. But what? Restore unto me the joy of salvation and renew a right spirit within me. As the song is being sung, can you rededicate your heart? Can you respond to the word? Can you obey the voice of God so that the Holy Spirit will store your souls? The Holy Spirit will store your hearts this morning. Look to God. Look to God. Jesus. If you need prayer, you're welcome to come forward. There is power in prayer. But there is even greater power when you obey the voice of God. Father, we are sorry 
that we have confirmed you within our time that we have taken kairos and put it in chronos based on our schedules change our hearts revive us lord that we have built our own homes and given you second or third or last place many a times just to make sure that we worship you we have lost the meaning of worship revive our hearts help us to not focus on what we are building but to rebuild ourselves to be a vessel where you would dwell revive our hearts god stir a new spirit in us as we spend time in your presence for those who are fasting and praying seeking more of you more than any needs they have on their prayer list let the number one be lord let me be a vessel to work to carry you lord jesus stir in our hearts lord a passion for you so that we prepare ourselves for the latter glory which is greater than everything else that we feel we enjoy here on this earth prepare ourselves for eternity because we don't have much time left for us whatever be the inflections or difficulties we have help us to focus ourselves on the cross on eternity god strengthen us and send us with your grace we especially come at all the young ones who are starting a new season in their life some of them transitioning from elementary to middle school some of them from middle school to high school some of them from high school to college some of them a new school a new city a new environment whatever be it lord jesus in all that transition let you be the greatest treasure to lord jesus help them to seek you that the fear of the lord be their wisdom that they will put you first in all the needs that they have rebuild this generation rise up a new generation a remnant that will search after you lord jesus for those who are leaving town who are driving pray your protection over them for those who are starting a new season away pray your covering over them lord we pray for peace for the parents that they know that god you are in control this is your children bless them god we come in the prayers especially this week let your spirit fall among us as we sing and pray let that be truly revealed that we see your presence among us that my spirit dwells among you let that be our desire send us with your grace and blessings in Jesus mighty name we pray amen